So welcome to the IPM Hour. Um, this is our second edition of it, and I'm glad you all can make it. We've got two good presentations today. Uh, the first one is by Stephanie Bolton, Dr. Stephanie Bolton, who is the Research and Education Director and Sustainable Wine Growing Director of the Lodi Wine Commission. Stephanie, welcome. Thank you. Um, and we'll turn it over to you. Start your slides and your presentation however, however you wish to. Okay, thank you, Steve. We will share the screen now. Thank you all for joining us. All right, so good afternoon. Like Steve said, my name is Stephanie Bolton, and I'm going to talk about how we've had fun in Lodi, California, using beneficial insects to engage the public and the next generation. So I work for 750 wine grape farmers who make up the Lodi Wine Grape Commission. They tax themselves on the sale of their grapes, and that money goes into research, education, and promotion. Back in 1992, these farmers started a grassroots IPM program, which later became the first sustainable wine growing certification program called Lodi Rules. We do have Cliff Omart on the line today, so he can tell you lots more about getting that program up and going as he was instrumental to starting that certification program. Thanks for being on here, Cliff. Because of this program's scientific merit and popularity, people from all over the world frequently ask me for tours to see sustainability. Showing the public sustainability became a lot easier when I started learning about beneficial insects and their historical and significant role in agriculture. You see, we, we live sustainability here in Lodi. It's just um, part of our daily lives. And so when people ask, they want to just come at their convenient time to see sustainability, you don't always have something happening that is easy to communicate to the general public um, about sustainability. So we were really looking for topics that would engage people and give them a hands-on experience of sustainable agriculture. Learning about beneficial insects was not something that happened during my plant pathology PhD coursework, unfortunately. It happened out of necessity as we formed collaborative teams to study a big challenge we're facing in the wine grape industry, grapevine leaf roll virus. As some of you may know, we have an invasive pest called the vine mealybug, which is spreading across California vineyards like wildfire. It was introduced from suitcase material smuggled into the Coachella Valley. These insects have five to seven generations per year in Lodi, with each female producing 300 eggs. And if you do the math, that means that one mating pair of mealybugs in the beginning of the growing season can end up as trillions of mealybugs by the end of the growing season, each capable of infecting a vine with the leaf roll virus. What makes these vine mealybugs so dangerous for us is that transmission of leaf roll virus from vine to vine and also from vineyard to vineyard. Leaf roll virus decreases photosynthesis and can lead to poor and even ripening, reduced grape quality, and lower yield. In red grape varieties, leaves show characteristic red leaf symptoms like this leaf pictured here. For the last 10 years, we've been having mysterious patches of vines dying in some vineyards. We just recently discovered with the help of some UC scientists that these are caused by a co-infection of two mealybug vectored viruses, leaf roll virus and avitavirus, plus certain virus sensitive root stalks. This is what we're calling the sudden vine collapse. Without being able to eradicate vine mealybugs and due to the devastating effects of viruses on quality and profitability, many farmers have had to remove acres and acres of vineyards. We probably saw about 10,000 acres removed in Lodi this past year, not all due to virus infections, but it's definitely a contributing factor. In 2017, we formed an expert team to take a deep dive into mealybug biocontrol in our region. We learned that we have two main beneficial insects helping us with mealybugs, the Anagyrus wasp and the Cryptolamus beetle. Pictured here are mealybug females, which have been parasitized by anagyrus wasps. It's a neat story. The wasp oviposits an egg inside the live mealybug's body. The wasp egg grows inside the mealybug until it is big enough to chew its way out, leaving a gaping hole in the mealybug's shell. As the wasp itself is hard to find in the vineyard, 
We teach farmers and scouts to look for parasitized mealybugs like this one to know that they have the beneficial wasps present in their vineyard. We're very lucky that Dr. Kent Dana released these wasps pictured on the right in our region years ago because they can be found in almost any vineyard with mealybugs now. The second beneficial insect important to balance the vine mealybugs in our ecosystem is the Cryptolamus beetle. These guys love to eat mealybugs. Pictured here is the adult crypto beetle. Like the wasps, the beetles have a fascinating science story. In their juvenile form, they look like a shaggy mealybug so that they can act like a wolf in sheep's clothing and feed on their prey without being noticed. Here you can see the vine mealybug on the left and the cryptolamus beetle on the right for comparison. The natural mealybug disguise is important because the vine mealybugs have beneficial insect bodyguards, ants. Ants farm vine mealybugs for their sweet honeydew, and I've watched ants pick up and carry these beetles away from mealybug colonies. It's really fun to watch if you get a chance to, to look at that in the vineyard. The ant mealybug story is fascinating too. Pictured here is an ant with a mouthful of vine mealybug eggs, carrying them across a drip irrigation line to start a new colony on another vine. Because we consider these beneficial insects such a crucial part of mealybug IPM, we wanted to make sure that our farmers weren't accidentally killing these beneficials with their spray program. So we studied the UC IPM toxicity chart, and with permission, thank you, Jim, we combined it with local experiences and created an easy to understand table for farmers. Pictured here is the first page of that chart. And we've been passing this chart out with our sustainability program materials at our um, grower meetings and workshops. And we also have it in a new management book that we released, which I'll show you later. So as you saw earlier, this whole mealybug and virus situation can be pretty depressing. We've also tried to make it fun. Here you can see Madeline Kolber in the center wearing our custom mealybug flagging tape, which we use for marking mealybug hotspots. So what makes beneficial insects super fun and exciting is that you can release them over your farm with a drone. A company called Parabug has been kind enough to demo their drone for us a few times, and we always turn it into a family affair. Maybe some of you guys have seen this in action. The children of our farmers love playing with the beetles and helping to load them into the drone. Last summer, as part of a Western Fair grant project, we hosted a biocontrol family field day out at Michael David Winery at one of their vineyards. We set the events up like a little carnival with educational crafts and activities for all ages, everything having an insect or biocontrol theme. You could get insects painted on your face, you could drink orange bug juice, and lots more. Associates in Sectory, which some of you may know, they're down near Ventura. They kindly packaged crypto beetles in tubes for us so that each kid could have their own beetles to release at the event. I dressed up like a superhero wasp and told the science story of the mealybugs, viruses, wasps, and beetles to the children, hoping that the grown-ups would absorb some of the learning too. We had a great turnout with the county ag commissioner, the local news channel, local newspapers, and the acting deputy of the California DPR all attending, of course, along with our farming families. Footage from this field day will be available soon as part of a mealybug biocontrol educational video that's also part of the Western Stair Grant. We had fun also partnering with our local science museum, the WOW Museum, and they let our kids dissect owl pellets. So our farmers donate owl pellets from their barn owl boxes, which are used in the vineyard to control rodents, to the museum and then the museum lets kids dissect the pellets and so we thought this would be a good opportunity to get the WOW Museum involved out in a tailgate talk with the farmers and yeah it was a lot of fun. 
So maybe you are looking for some fun science um, stories for the kids in your life. And if you'd like to, uh, to learn more about the beneficial insects and the mealybugs, Coper, a company that manufactures beneficial insects, they have a great video on YouTube showing the, what they're calling the cryptobug, the cryptolamus beetle eating mealybugs. And then they also have an excellent video that shows the anagyrus wasp stinging a mealybug and then ovipositing an egg, which is really cool to watch. And it's a quick short video. We continue to partner with the Xerces Society. Um, if you don't know about them, they're a really great nonprofit organization and they provide amazing science-based resources for farmers on beneficial insects. I can't recommend their book, Farming with Native Beneficial Insects, enough. It's an easy read full of pictures with case studies and a lot of practical information. And what's great about their information is that they also um, make it regionally specific so that um, they have these, these um, plant charts so that you can know what native species would do well in your region and which native species would attract um, the beneficial insects or be habitat for the monarch butterflies, for example. I really think that over time we've become more and more reliant on the effective and efficient and affordable plant protectant materials that are available, but I also think it's crucial for us to refocus on identifying and ensuring the viability of our beneficial insects on our farms, which do so much for the farmer. And over time, they can become free if you provide habitat for them. So as people are coming to our farms on sustainable agritourism field trips, which happens a lot, we've started telling the beneficial insect biocontrol story to them using hands-on insect hotels. Um, these are fun, um, I think sometimes, sometimes very strict scientists think, oh, a little insect hotel, that's not really doing anything. But we have to remember that we need to take our science and communicate it in a way that is understandable to the public. Otherwise, it's not doing as much good as it could be doing. So these insect hotels are cute representations um, of of farmers trying to protect insects on their farm. And they do not tell the whole story, but that's where the communication part is. So we had a group of international college students from Germany come through Lodi. And um, over lunch in the Delta region, we were able to um, tell them some of the story that I'm sharing with you today about mealybugs and viruses and beneficial insects. And then they crafted an insect hotel together, which will then mark their visit um, with us forever when we put it in the vineyard. So it's really fun, um, really fun way to engage, engage people in these tours. I'm sure all of us on this call give lots of different kinds of tours and the more um, experiential you can make them, I think the, the, more, the better impression we make and the more they remember the science part. So we've been incorporating beneficial insects into our IPM breakfast meetings, which we have every month. And the Xerces Society has really been helpful in coming and speaking at some of these meetings. These educational opportunities are attracting a diverse group of farmers, viticulturists, pest control advisors, and county specialists. So we've had a, a lot of fun doing it, and also um, we're engaging a wide audience, which we need to understand the importance of the beneficial insects. For our last in-person meeting on March 10th, we had a hedgerow workshop and a, we, an artist designed this beautiful illustration to educate people on the importance of the beneficial insect habitat. Um, sometimes pretty pictures help attract <laughs> people to our scientific education too, right? Uh, at the hedgerow workshop, people were able to see, touch, and plant a variety of native species that were donated by cornflower farms. We also had milkweed starters that were donated by Delta College for monarch butterflies. And once again, we were able to involve our children who had a lot of fun at the event. Um, I'd like to let you know that we just released a 138 page book with the help of grant funding from the American Vineyard Foundation and the CDFA PD Bush Board on grapevine virus management. And we included tons of photos and education on the importance of beneficial insects in managing mealybugs. And this book also comes with a mealybug scouting card that not only shows farmers how to identify mealybugs in their vineyard, which is really a lot more difficult than you would think, 
Um, usually by the time a farmer sees mealybugs in the vineyard, it's already pretty late. There's already a huge population of them once, once it gets to the time where they can spot them on the vines and the canopy. Mealybugs like to hide under the bark on the trunk and a little bit in the roots. So we also included a, um, on the scouting card, we also included scouting for the beneficial insects, which is um, just, at, well, which is very important to the IPM management of the integrated pest management of the mealybug, right? So we included um, how to find those beneficial insects on that scouting card and, and hopefully we can start doing more of that, not just with mealybugs, but with other beneficial insects as well. So thanks for listening and I would love to hear what all of you all are doing to engage your communities with IPM and sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, can you stop sharing your screen? Perfect. Uh, we'll open it up to questions. I'm going to ask the first one. Um, have you seen growers changing their spray regimes to preserve beneficial insects as you've been doing this work? So I'm not um, privy to the individual spray programs, but there has definitely been an increased awareness of not killing the beneficial insects. We made that a big priority from that first mealybug biocontrol group we formed in 2017. And um, I've had lots of conversations with them about it. So I'm assuming that they are following through and changing their spray programs based on those conversations. You know, that's a tricky thing though. Um, it's not, it's not as black and white as we'd like it to be. It's not, it's not just don't use this material because it kills insects. It's all about the timing and the application. And so really learning about identifying and scouting for those beneficial insects, I think is crucial when it comes to making sure that you're, you're not accidentally killing those beneficials. And so that's why we've had a lot, um, I guess you've, I can't answer your question specifically, but that's why we've had, we feel like we've had a lot of success by hosting lots of meetings where we set up stations in the vineyards and we have um, PCAs and scouts out there to show small groups of farmers how to identify those beneficial insects in person. And it's amazing how many people can't, didn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. All right. Other questions for Stephanie? Thank you, wonderful presentation. Um, hey. Good questions. I, I had a question. This is Katie Murray from Oregon. Hi, Stephanie, that was really interesting. Hey. And my question is um, similar to Steve's, but just perhaps slightly more broad. I'm just curious, maybe if you're not tracking any outcomes now, you know, it seems like there's a lot of potential here, given the, the organization around this type of project to really track either levels of beneficials on farms or changes in pesticide use or changes in pest pressure. You know, I, I just would be curious if that's part of the project or going to be integrated in some way because I think that that's of course where our minds go as well right. is that what what difference will this make ultimately and we love to see outcomes and changes in IPM adoption. Yeah well you have to remember that we did this is all part of learning for the ultimately the virus management so we're kind of doing more measuring in terms of of um, growers having a paradigm shift in in switching from their mindset of, I don't care about viruses, I don't really know about them, I don't really understand them, to I need to manage for viruses. So um, the Xerces Society, they do some beneficial insect monitoring, and we may, we have talked with them recently about doing a little bit more. Um, but we're not, I don't know, I guess I might have a different philosophy on that a little bit. I want the action to happen out there. I want the farmers to under, learn and make their, make their educated decisions more so than I want to be measuring them every step of the way um, when we know that this is a good thing. So we already know that, we already know that the beneficial insects are helpful to the vineyard. They work in the vineyard. They can survive in our vineyards. There's a lot of research done with that. We did get um, with Kent Dana we did get a million dollar BISC grant recently, and so there will be some measurements with that program. Um, I don't know what his plan is specifically to measure the insects, but that I was 
I've definitely been pushing him to include more of the beneficial insects part of the research. So maybe there's more to come, Katie. But Cliff, Cliff's on the call, I think still, maybe. And, and he wrote a lovely paper, um, lovely, lovely, logical, well-written paper about the reduction in harsher chemistries um, of the plant protective materials over time in Lodi um, with adoption of the Lodi Rules Program. All right, other questions? Muted. Uh, hi, this is Al Forner. Stephanie, I enjoyed your uh, presentation. Uh, just a quick question, and I apologize if you said it, I may have missed it. Um, on the crypto beetle, is that, that's fascinating, that mimicry. And uh, I was just curious to know a little bit more um, whether that was a native insect or was it imported perhaps with the, with the mealybugs? Or do you know anything more about sort of the evolution, the history of it? I'm not sure the origin of the Cryptolambus beetle. The Associates Insectary is the group that taught me about the beetle. Um, they're the ones I said they're down in Ventura and they give a great tour once we can travel again. Um, Brett Chandler is the president of that. It's, it's, a, it's a really new organization that was founded in 1918 and they rear the beetles there. So they would, they would definitely be able to answer that question. But I know that it's, um, that beetle was used in the citrus industry for a long time, so. I see, and the, um, the ants are also pretty fascinating, aren't they? So yeah. if I understood you, they, they not only, uh, you know, tend to the mealybugs and help start new colonies, they also fend off the beetles as well, is that right? Yes, I felt so guilty. So the Associates Insectary was donating Cryptolamus beetles to us, and we were kind of monitoring if we released the beetles, could we then find the beetles four weeks later to see if they were staying in that place and, and reproducing there or not? Um, and we were able to find them, but it, it's again, it's kind of what I was telling Katie, like it's, some of these things are a little bit difficult to quantify because um, you don't know what natural population was already out there. But the ants, I, would, I went out there and you, you release them when the sun is going down and they're little tubes like I showed you and you just, if you do it by hand, you're just, tapping um, on the on the top of the vine and I was just felt so guilty because I was just putting them to their death because there were so many ants out there and the ants were just picking them up and the beetles they when you release them they're kind of sluggish because they've been in the tube for a little while which is good because you don't want them to just fly away but they were just they they weren't awake enough yet to defend themselves and fly away and those ants were just yeah picking them up and carrying them away it was amazing to watch Wow. The so. ants are a big, a big problem and it's so hard because there's beneficial ants out there, right? It's helping you aerate the soil and, and do things. And then there's these ants that are just spreading the mealybugs and therefore the virus all around the vineyard. So we're, we're doing a lot of research on ant, ant bait. Yeah, interesting. You're, you're targeting some of your outreach at, at families and kids. Yeah. How did that? How did that idea come about? Um, and and what benefits have you seen from from making it a family affair? Well, it's really just because I love children, <laughs> and I wanted I wanted to invite them out to um, some of the fun things we're doing. But um, part of the reason it's me. If you look at different regional sustainability programs, you see a little bit of differences in the reason why farmers choose to farm sustainability or sorry to farm sustainably so um, for example on the central coast you see more of an environmental pull so they want to do the right thing for the environment in Lodi it's more that it's because they want to leave a legacy of a, fam it's a family farm and they want to have their children um, have the option of farming that land like generations before them and so I thought that our farmers would really enjoy tools to pass down some of this to make um, the children interested in the farming and and so we're always trying to engage the children with the sustainability. Um, and we did a fun video where we interviewed the children of farmers and winemakers and we asked them without any kind of preparation, it was a very low budget video, 
um, what is sustainability? And we asked them a few questions about that. And it was so neat to see that a lot of them knew what it was and could even describe it better than some of their parents. So that's a fun video. That's at lodirules.org if you want to see that. But yeah, it, honestly, it, just, it really makes the job more fun for all of us. Like I said, this, some of this stuff is pretty depressing. You know, uh, our market is a little depressing right now. Profitability is, is tough. And so having, having the kids around makes you remember why you're doing it. Yeah. Excellent. Other questions? We have time for a couple more, maybe? Okay, Cliff, if you want to say anything. I can just do a quick comment on the pet. This is the, that pesticide article yeah. is just one of the great examples of the pesticide use database they have in California. It's, it's about a year to two out of date, but I literally, I just focused on the pesticides, the DPR, the Department right of Pesticide Regulation had focused on as um, high risk pesticides. And one of them was chlorpyrifos. And um, it, I just went in and they do it county by county. And so I, I partly did it so other people might want to do it, but nobody's picked up on it. Uh, but it, you're right, it was very impressive. And I think um, with the Lodi Rules program getting larger, I think you and I have talked about being able to maybe look at anonymously, you know, pesticide use at, over time with the Lodi Rules program because we're going to be using the pesticide risk tool. And so, um, it's a it, that database is so invaluable. The pesticide use database. Yeah. Thanks, Cliff. Yeah. Great, great job, Stephanie. Thank you. And one of the things I do want to say, one of the great things that Stephanie's brought to the program in Lodi is the whole youth component, because we didn't do any of that. And and it was such a great idea, Stephanie, that you did that. It's really neat. Thanks. Well, like I said, it just makes it fun. You know, the kids are so excited and, and I mean, I, I was so silly to dress up like that wasp superhero, but I didn't care because I thought if we are giving the kids the storytelling that we're getting some of that education to the 80 year olds in the audience too, right? Um, so whatever works. Whatever works. I like <laughs> And as far as the market, I'm doing my part. I'm trying. Uh, what are you doing, Steve? <laughs> drinking wine in the pandemic. Oh, thank you. Yes, we Cheers love you. Thank words. you very Love's much. <laughs> Cheers to that. It actually, it actually that you are literally helping. So last year, the market was really down. We were very, very oversupplied, grapes and wine. And um, this, so no new contracts pretty much. This year, there's actually some contracts opening up because a lot of the grapes in Lodi go to the, the, um, the wineries that have a lot of the affordable wine in the supermarkets, which is where you are buying your wine right now for the most part. So we got a little bit, we feel a little bit, there's a little silver lining for, for us with that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, it's 12.30. Thank you very much. That was a, that was a great presentation. We're going to switch over now um, to our second presenter. So, Alec, if you can come back online, um, I'll do the introduction. So, our second presenter, um, Alec Kowalski, Associate Professor and Turf Specialist at Oregon State University, who is going to talk about some of their work on... Um, nope on School Life here. Take it away. Okay, thanks Steve. Uh, how's everybody doing? Good, okay. So uh, I was gonna just quickly share with you uh, adapting to the pandemic here. I teach classes at Oregon State University. This last term I taught uh, two classes online and I have had the same haircut for about the last 15 or 20 years, but the undergrad students don't know that I have turned the back into a mohawk. So I've been working that into the COVID situation here. Uh, the other thing I do is when I lecture on Wednesday, I usually make all the students wear a hat. And 
today happens to be Wednesday, so I thought we would wear hats if you want to join me. And I usually let the students pick a hat as well. So my options today are my fedora here, which I personally like. I also have a trucker hat here. <clears throat> and then uh, by far the student favorite here is my Indiana Dr. Jones hat. So is there any input on hat options or should I just pick one? I think Steve Elliott put a thumbs up for the fedora. You bet. Yes, I'll second that. All right. Fedora, yeah, fedora. <laughs> All right, thanks, Chris. <laughs> okay, so let's go over to the uh, PowerPoint now that we've got the, the business out of the way here. <clears throat> So do you all see uh, a PowerPoint presentation? Yep. Okay, excellent. So we're talking about uh, advancing use of key integrated pest management practices in schools, okay? So I'm just gonna back up and quickly talk about how I became involved in this program, okay? So when we view uh, turf grass management, uh, dollars spent per acre, uh, I would imagine that most people know that golf courses get a lot of money to manage the grass. Uh, in terms of a research aspect, which I also do, uh, we get the most uh, finances for research related to golf. But if you look at this list, at the bottom of the list, list is municipal turf. So actually municipal turf has the lowest amount of dollars spent per acre. Uh, but if you look at total acreage across the United States of America, Municipal turf by far has more acreage than residential and commercial turf, golf courses, and sports fields, uh, but it has the lowest dollar per acre amount, okay? And then within municipal turf, we usually consider roadsides, public parks, and public schools part of the municipal turf program, okay? So in the state of Oregon, we have a lot of social pressure to reduce pesticide use on landscapes, particularly publicly used landscapes like uh, public schools, okay? And uh, as I said earlier, um, I don't get a whole lot of money to do research on municipal turf grass management, but as Stephanie said in her presentation, she loves children and, and I really am invested in this program because I want to have an impact on our children. My daughter is a 10-year-old in the, the public school system, and uh, I think this is a very important thing, and I'm putting a lot of energy into that because of that. Okay, so uh, if we back up in 2009, uh, Oregon State Legislature uh, put into effect the Integrated Pest Management Program for Schools. Okay, so this law has several different things in it. Uh, some of the major points of the law include uh, all schools having an IPM plan, uh, all the schools having a list of acceptable low-impact pesticides, uh, schools designating an IPM coordinator, which is often a person who is uh, uh, their grounds lead and often the custodian and often the pesticide applicator. So this is a person that is spread very thin across multiple parts of maintaining the school here, okay? And then we're gonna focus today about uh, these last two parts of the law, which are annual IPM uh, coordinator training and periodic training for school employees, which we provide, okay? So if I go back to the beginning of this program from uh, 2009 to 2013, Tim Stock was the uh, person who was in charge and running this program essentially by himself. Uh, he would do some of the lectures. He would also bring in guest speakers to talk about all kinds of different uh, topics like barn swallow uh, management, uh, wasps coming in, uh, man managing the wasps and uh, uh, managing the ground squirrels as well. And I got a couple of notes here, you know, barn swallows poop everywhere, wasps sting and ground squirrels a dig. You know, these are some pretty, pretty uh, basic problems that we're having at these schools trying to uh, improve the public school system, okay? 
So then since 2013, uh, I joined Oregon State University, and then I became part of the IPM program, helping Tim Stock, uh, and I focus on outdoor management. And within this, I, I also bring my team into it. So I've got uh, technicians, Brian McDonald, Emily Braithwaite, uh, a postdoc now, Clint Maddox, and uh, a graduate student, Alyssa Kane. And we help uh, with this program and we serve as guest lecturers for the IPM program. Okay, so every year, uh, Tim and my team do 10 uh, training events across the state. Uh, it rotates around and it goes as far north as Portland. Uh, you know, down into Ashland, which is about as far south as you can get in the state, all the way over to Reedsport, which is on the coast, and then sometimes as far east as Ontario, which is uh, all the way over by Idaho there. Okay, and, uh, you know, we typically reach 100% or really close to 100% of the school districts because this is a state requirement. Everybody has to have this annual training. Okay. Uh, so... Oh, I wasn't ready for that to start by itself, but <laughs> um, uh, within our program, we have uh, formal lectures, uh, mixed media, uh, open discussion, and hands-on on training. We've got all kinds of different ways to uh, educate people. And in this video here, Tim is showing a, a press release of uh, a pesticide application made at a public, public school, and then the children went out and played on the playground afterwards, and some of them got skin rashes from the pesticide that was used on the playground equipment. So keeping people up to date on problems like that. So within the IPM program, uh, Tim also manages a website and on the website, he puts his extension publications. He has a sample low impact pesticide list that school employees can use for a reference. And he also has a model IPM plan, which people can download and again, use as a reference when developing their IPM plans. Okay, and he also has registration for the annual training. Okay, so then uh, as we move forward in time a little bit around 2013, uh, when I joined the IPM, school IPM program with Tim, uh, we got this Metro IPM grant from 2013 to 2015. We were working with Portland Public Schools, so we we're making the trip up to Portland quite frequently here. And uh, we provided supplemental training events. And in these training events, we gave out uh, complimentary spill kits. Uh, kind of, again, as, as Stephanie was talking about, doing whatever we can to engage attendees in different ways. You know, giving them gifts, giving them publications, talking to them. Uh, we did uh, a research project on campus and had uh, people down to campus to look at their research projects. We produced a, a series of extension videos on basic management practices for, for lawn and landscape care. Uh, and we did site visits across uh, the Portland area, visiting multiple schools, doing irrigation audits, soil sampling, pesticide storage evaluation, and record keeping evaluation. We gave these uh, schools reports and then we did follow up visits to see if they made changes according to the input that we provided. Okay. And we saw it all, you know, we saw people doing really good stuff. Um, I feel like I sounded like Donald Trump there for a second. We, we saw people doing things. Uh, <laughs> we, we saw really good efforts towards uh, pesticide safety and pesticide storage. And we also saw the uh, opposite side of that coin. We saw some, some big no-nos and some big problems, and we made some really significant corrections to facilities like this. So we saw bad situations and we turned it around with some simple visits and then follow-up visits. Okay, so again, overview here. Tim Stock ran the IPM program from 2009 to 2013. I joined it in 2013 along with my group of folks from uh, turf grass and landscape management. And in 2016, uh, Tim did this survey where he looked at uh, successes and failures in our IPM program. And the idea here with the survey was to document uh, what people should focus on when developing an IPM program for public schools. 
and uh, the intention was to provide an extension tool that other IPM specialists can use when developing school IPM programs. So 37 of the 50 US states have pesticide restrictions and laws associated with public schools. Uh, this list here, uh, Oregon is on here. All of these schools, or all these states, excuse me, have equivalent pesticide restrictions to the state of Oregon. So all the school, all the, I keep saying schools, all the states in black have laws just as strict as Oregon. The states in red actually have laws that are more strict than Oregon. So Maine, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Texas actually has more laws associated with pesticides used in and around schools than these other ones on the list here. But 37 total have laws associated to uh, pesticide use in and around schools. So the survey, the intention was to determine the number of new and returning attendees uh, or trainees, excuse me, determine what IPM practices and materials were being used in schools as a result of the training program, and determine whether schools were reducing pesticide use as a result of our training, okay? So we are gonna transition over to some methods and materials here. So this was done in 2016. We had 11 training events that year. Um, we had 361 attendees at these 11 different training events. Uh, again, representing close to 100% of the school districts in the state of Oregon, 317 people total completed the survey, okay? So as we move along to our survey results here, okay? So in this slide here, you're looking at the survey of OSU school IPM program attendees collected before the start of the 2016 training. There was 10, or excuse me, 11 training events throughout the year and we collected surveys from all of these 11 events, okay? So we first wanted to know if people were new attendees or returning attendees, okay? And about 75% of the participants are returning attendees and you know, 24%, uh, about a quarter are new attendees. So there's a significant turnover in uh, public school employees and IPM coordinators. They're transitioning out, they're finding better jobs, they're finding different jobs in landscape management. But for whatever reason, we see a heavy turnover in the amount of people that are IPM coordinators. Okay, so then of the returning attendees, how many of them are using IPM practices presented at the training? That's the top uh, row there. And we see that, you know, of the 240 returning attendees, 100% of them are using uh, training practices, IPM practices presented at the uh, training that we give. And then of the 77 new attendees, 58% of them are using IPM practices that are provided by the OSU IPM program, uh, which as we dug into a little more, we found they were getting this information from the previous IPM coordinator that was passing it along, or they were finding it on the internet. So they were getting it from the extension website that Tim has and runs for IPM school coordinators. So the returning attendees, they're attending the training, they're getting the information, they're using the information. Then the new attendees, a lot of them are making the effort to go get the information online and use it in preparation for starting their job as an IPM coordinator, okay? So then as we move further into the study here, uh, key IPM practices and materials being used as a result of the OSU school IPM program for schools, and this is an assessment of people who are returning attendees, okay? So what we see here is the things people found the most important, most uh, essential to their IPM program were resolving uh, indoor issues associated with rodents. So sealing up holes around uh, walls, cracks, uh, and crevices to keep pests out of the building. That was the most important thing that people were changing and doing for their IPM program. The second most important thing is people were installing or replacing external door sweeps and third most important was updating their uh, record keeping and pest management actions. So keeping a record of 
of all the things they're doing related to pest management. So those were the three most important things that returning attendees were doing. So these are people that have been at the training multiple years. These are the biggest strides they've been making. And then if we start to look at the outdoor practices, uh, the three most important outdoor practices, and you see the statistics drop way down, was turf fertilization practices, turf irrigation practices, and turf mowing practices. So people are focusing more on indoor IPM, and there's a relatively low adoption of outdoor IPM practices that were provided. So this was back in 2016, okay? And then if we look at uh, pesticide restrictions here, or reducing pesticide use, excuse me, uh, you know, around 66% of the public schools are reducing their pesticide use in buildings, and then around 60% are reducing their pesticide uh, use out in the landscape around the schools, okay? So, you know, a quick overview of the data I just gave you, reducing pesticide use in the landscape was about 60%, and, and this is the result of the training we're doing, some of the legislature that's put into effect, and uh, social pressure to reduce pesticides. Uh, we find in, in talking to our IPM coordinators. And we had relatively low adaption of some really basic IPM practices for landscape management, mowing, irrigation, and fertilization. So as a, as a response to that, we found that when you look at the IPM resources that are available on the internet back in 2016, we did not have information on landscape management in there. So since 2016, we have integrated the landscape management recommendations and publications into the IPM resources that are available online, okay? So now let's switch over and talk about new attendees. I'm just gonna look at the clock and see how we're doing on time. Okay, so let's look at new attendees here for a second. Uh, and again, the most important po cultural practices or excuse me, IPM practices that people are adapting here. Uh, for new people that have never done the training before, they started with record keeping as their most important thing. Okay, so as they're getting into this habit of I being an IPM coordinator and doing school IPM, record keeping was the first step they're taking. The second thing, again, they're sealing up holes, they're keeping pests out of the buildings. And then the third most important thing for the new people was looking at the IPM plan uh, that they have for their school, uh, adopting that and changing that. And an interesting thing here, when we look at Oregon Department of Agriculture uh, regulation violations associated with schools, some of the most frequent violations we see is the school doesn't have a proper IPM plan in effect, which is interesting because it seems to be a relatively high priority in IPM coordinators. So there is some kind of disconnect there between the training that's available, the IPM coordinators, and the law there. We're providing the training, people are implementing the uh, recommendations we have, but they're not getting them to the level that the Oregon Department of Agriculture wants. So something is a little miss, a little off there in our uh, coordination back and forth, okay? So then when we now look at the uh, uh, school outdoor IPM practices, again, from the new attendees, these are people that are new IPM coordinators. Again, you see really, really low adaptation of uh, turf and landscape management practices, particularly I've highlighted here, mowing, fertilization, and irrigation. The, the three things we think of as the core crux of, of landscape or turf IPM, okay? And then when we look at pesticide reductions here, even the new employees are making some pesticide reductions. Uh, new school IPM coordinators are reporting uh, around a 39% a reduction in pesticide use in the schools, and then a 31% pesticide reduction use outside of schools. So it takes these IPM coordinators a couple years, uh, more than one training event to really make big strides in reducing pesticide use, okay? Uh, and there's a quick overview of that data there. Relatively low reductions in pesticide use with new employees, and then a very low adaptation of mowing, fertilization, and irrigation practices. 
And again, a, a way we've improved that is putting this material on the uh, uh, IPM uh, website, making it available to attendees looking at the web. Okay. So then uh, since 2016 to now, we've had a, a USDA NEPA grant uh, associated with school IPM. And as I talked about earlier, we've been really working to uh, produce publications and information on school outdoor IPM and then adding that to the website and getting it to our public school employees. So since 2016, we've been working on amending our deficiencies here. And most of that has been funded through this USDA NEPA grant. Uh, we produced several extension publications, added those to the website, uh, added those to the IPM website. And we've also been giving uh, attendees gifts. So we go out and we buy people things to use in the landscape, which is, is a really popular thing. So I think two years ago, I bought a thousand rain, rain gauges and I let public schools take as many as they wanted. And, you know, some schools would take 10 or 20 rain gauges with the intention that they're going to do an irrigation audit on their soccer field or their football field or their baseball field. So again, we're trying to connect with people as many different ways as possible. Okay. We've also started a school IPM uh, grounds training event that we have at Corvallis, which is very centrally located in the state of Oregon. Uh, we have uh, this grounds employee training. Uh, you know, I think we average around 51 attendees, and that represents uh, 26 of the, I think it's 197 school districts. Uh, I'm not sure if that's right, but that's just what came to mind when I thought of the number of school districts in Oregon. Um, but, you know, we do all kinds of different things uh, associated to uh, IPM in the landscape. We do uh, rodent trapping, irrigation auditing. We go on campus and we visit the folks taking care of uh, landscapes on campuses. We have uh, landscape experiments set up on campus for the public school employees to tour and uh, make decisions on. They look at the, the plants that are surviving well in low input situations and then they can make changes to their own landscapes similar to that. Uh, and We've had this ongoing research project uh, looking at different mowing height and frequencies, irrigation rates and frequencies, and uh, fertility rates and frequencies for uh, public schools. And again, that's to address this deficiency related to uh, information associated with uh, public schools not adapting the uh, lawn care practices that we've had available. So this uh, research project focused on Managing turf grass with just mowing, fertilization, and irrigation practices has been very popular. Uh, we've had a couple publications on it, and it's been reproduced uh, all over the state. Uh, you know, uh, states as far as uh, Massachusetts uh, and uh, in the New England area, they've reproduced this publication and and provided it with their local stakeholders. So it's been a a successful research project. People are very excited about the information. And we continue to provide the 10 uh, annual training events. Uh, I see Tim Stock is on the, the conference with us. This year, things have been a little different uh, because of the COVID situation. So we're gonna do the training online. If anyone would like to talk to Tim about this after I'm done, I'm sure Tim would be uh, up for the conversation about providing uh, online Zoom style IPM coordinator training, which I think is going to be a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, and then we do annual surveys and we uh, what people are learning about, what they want more information about. And, you know, in the last four years, some of the top three things on the, the surveys repeatedly, people want more information about turf grass and landscape management, which means we're we're now venturing from the inside of the school to the outside of the school and trying to bring down our pesticide use outside of the school uh, at levels that we see inside the school already. Okay, so uh, some conclusions here. You know, 100% of the returning attendees are using the IPM practices that Tim and I, uh, Tim and the OSU Turf program uh, teach attendees. 70%, 75% of the new attendees are using this information. 
Uh, these new attendees are either getting that information from the previous uh, IPM coordinator or they're finding it on the website. Uh, the key materials that we find for schools is rodent prevention, particularly sealing up holes and keeping out pests and installing door sweeps, keeping records of complaints and actions, and using the OSU model IPM plan. Uh, those are the key things that people are doing uh, related to the school IPM program, okay? And then as we look at the outdoor efforts here, you know, back in 2016, uh, we had about a 60% uh, reduction in outdoor pesticide use from uh, schools with experienced IPM coordinators, a 31% reduction in outdoor pesticide use for the schools with new IPM coordinators. And then we had relatively low adaptation of the outdoor IPM practices. We have been working to improve that by providing extension bulletins, a field day, research projects and publications on our research related to school IPM practices. We've got demonstration plots for people to look at and we give gifts to the attendees when, when we interact with them again to try to get them to change the way they're managing the landscape. And with that, I, I think I'm done, uh, Steve and everyone. Yeah. If you have any <coughs> questions. Alec, um, yeah, any questions for Alec or Tim? Um, if Tim wants to chime in or, or answer questions, but any, any questions for either of them? Somebody unmuted, Tim unmuted, there you go. Just getting ready for if anybody wants to ask a question. <laughs> Don't have much comments. <laughs> I mean, especially since we've got, what, one minute left? Tim, I have a quick question. This is Belinda Messenger Sykes from UC IPM. Um, you guys have uh, reported pesticide use decreases. Are you able to verify that with any um, uh, official reporting? I'm not really sure what you guys do up there in Oregon for pesticide use reporting. We had it. There was a law. It lasted a few years. This is back more than 15 years ago, so we don't have anything official like that. Uh, there's required to keep records. The, law, the school IPM law requires uh, record keeping above and beyond what, what most uh, like commercial or public applicator applications are, uh, but it's still nothing that's reported. We've been trying to get uh, data on that, but the resource, we just don't have the resources to do that. Uh, we are in interaction with ODA, uh, pretty much uh, consistently. Um, they're involved in our training a lot last year, this year as well. And they are reporting, but it's all kind of anecdotally uh, that they, from their inspections, and they've, they've increased their number of inspections over the last uh, in investigations, inspections of school districts, uh, IPM programs over the last few, three, three, four years. And they have, again, anecdotally, shown and indicated that there has been a reduction but there's not we haven't been able to get that kind of hard data it's just more of self-reporting and we yeah. and I, I just say one other thing we i just remember we tried that from the very beginning of 2011 with a couple of the larger school districts the second and third largest school district uh, we were going to start working with them to to keep start keeping track of the data and they just weren't able to do that so you don't have pesticide use reporting like we do in California then? That's or correct. Again, like I said, over 15 years ago it was there, but it, it got kind of uh, stopped before it got started. Okay, thanks. That's, it's, 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 it's hard because people say all kinds of things on surveys. You can't, you have to kind of figure out, well, were they really remembering that right? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So, you know, it's it's just the uh, being able to go and look at what's going on uh, is, is great. And we do visit, uh, you know, we've trained over, we've had over 80 something trainings, <clears throat> excuse me, it's on our website. You can look at the, uh, you know, the past uh, events, I think it's over 80, mm, excuse me. <clears throat> and so we have, you know, we've seen sort of in our little anecdotal world, we've seen some reduction or improvements in turf management, especially which kind of belies the, the data that, that we got from our survey. <clears throat> Excuse me. I would like to add to that response to Belinda there. We have had uh, two publications on this, the 
The first one was uh, developing and delivering a needs-based integrated pest management program for public school grounds employees. That was published in uh, Natural, Science and Ed Natural Science Education. And for that publication, we developed a, a Qualtrics uh, survey where we sent it out to people and uh, they were reporting, self-reporting their number of pesticide applications. And we asked them to look at their records from five years earlier and then report what they had done five years before that. So that was in that 2016 publication. In the 2019 Journal of Extension publication, Advancing Use of Key Integrated Pest Management Practices in Schools, for that one, we just had a general survey question, did you reduce pesticide use? So I just thought I would throw that out there. There was a question. Thanks. Um, there was a question from Amanda Kaufman at California Department of uh, Pesticide Regulation. Oh, I just got that wrong, didn't I? Um, how did you identify the specific schools to outreach to, those you followed up with, and how did they react to your input? Um, sure. So for the outreach to specific schools, um, I guess, so the, the 10 IPM coordinator events reach all of the schools across the state. And we do the 10 IPM coordinator events kind of scattered throughout the state. So we have 10 events and then we move them around every year and we cover all of the school districts with that. And then in the 2013 to 2016 or 15 study that was funded by the uh, Metro government, we targeted uh, Portland area schools, but because it was funded by the Metro government, the uh, Portland area uh, funding program there. So that one was based on Portland schools only. And that was where a lot of the information for that first publication in uh, natural science education came from. And then uh, the school uh, field day that we have is down here in Corvallis and that's an open invitation that goes out to all the IPM coordinators and uh, people come and attend it and we get a pretty good distribution of people from across the state. Uh, relatively heavy in Salem and Eugene attendees because that's probably the closest big cities to Corvallis. We get a lot of attendees from Portland and we get a few people from the high desert area uh, and again, that kind of reflects the state populations of where the majority of the schools are across the state. Uh, did you want to add anything to that question and answer, Tim? Yeah, um, identifying this, this is going back to like 2011, 2012, when we first got started. We just uh, had a minimal amount of contacts with school districts and the uh, current and since then IPM coordinator for Salem-Kaiser School District, second largest school uh, district in the state. We got a, I wanted to say it was, no, it was an EPA, uh, uh, a small EPA grant and we started doing a pilot project in, um, at the, in that school district. And then from there, uh, that was kind of how we identified that specific school. You, I'm looking at your question, the wording of it to start to provide outreach to, but then the legislation happened. We contributed to the, I say we, I was part of that, the, the team that, that uh, provided guidance to the, what became the law and also the, some people from school districts. Um, once that came out, then the training requirement was there and I stepped up and kind of, you know, focused most of my attention on providing the training. And so we average over the last three years, four years, including this year, it's been, it really has been over 90% of the public school districts that we train and we do it in person except for this year. And so that's kind of like uh, we're I mean, it's kind of like following up every year because most of them train, you know, attend the training every year. And then the the grants that Alec had mentioned, that's sort of another way of following up. Um, we're also available. We can't, you know, it's just a, a few of us, so we can't go all over the state. Uh, but we, you know, do a lot of, I have a lot of phone and email conversations throughout the year. All right. Um, so one question, I mean, you, you showed the good and the bad, you know, photos, Alec, um, how they were doing pesticide storage. So when you visit a school or see a school or, or you're doing the training and, and see something like that, how, 
how are, are those recommendations received? So, uh, Steve, you're asking about the uh, pesticide storage issues? Yeah, or any, yeah. any sort of, eh, you probably ought to change this practice, perhaps. Um, well, so in that study we did with the Portland metro area, we looked at their pesticide storage and and some of those situations we were very adamant about things you're doing wrong and we expressed to them the concerns associated with it and i i don't know it's an interesting thing when you tell someone you shouldn't store a pesticide where you eat food or cook your lunch it, it dawns on them when you're telling them the risk associated with and it's like they're not thinking about it until you point it out. So Tim and I visited with these folks. We, we told them, you know, we're not going to turn you in. We're not going to uh, tattle on you. We just want to look at these situations and improve what you had. And we had really significant improvements. Uh, I think in that picture that you saw with the pesticides mixed in with the uh, athletic equipment, we came back and all of the pesticides were gone from that location and centralized in a cabinet that was that was locked. So we saw really significant improvements in this. The unfortunate thing is how much work is associated with driving to a school, looking at the pesticide records, looking at the storage situation, writing recommendations, going through the EPA checklist of, of what is supposed to be uh in the pesticide storage how things are supposed to be stored how things are supposed to be recorded so it's really labor intensive um and you know we we visited i think 10 schools out of uh 197 school districts and i think only one of the 10 schools had a, a clean pass on uh, uh having perfect pesticide storage or very close to perfect so uh, there is a big need for that. Uh, we have made a small dent in it and people did adapt our changes, but uh, it would be nice to connect with every school in that way. Right, all right. Well, we're about 10 minutes over time. So if anybody has um, one last question, we'll get it in. And if not, we'll say thanks to both our presenters, Alec and Stephanie. So any last questions? Really appreciate you both for uh, doing this today. Thanks for everyone who participated. We'll do it again next month, second Wednesday of the month. Um, and the folks who uh, will be presenting will be announced in the, the August newsletter that comes out the week before. So again, thanks everyone and uh, we'll see you in a month. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Great presentation, Stephanie. Thanks, bye. Bye. Thanks for the support, Tim.